the Apple II became one of the most popular computers ever. Although it was a vast improvement over the Apple I, it contains the same processor and runs at the same speed. New features include a color display, eight internal expansion slots, and a case with a keyboard. That may sound funny, but the Apple I and many other early computers didn't necessarily have a case or even a keyboard. On some systems, you had to add your own keyboard, if possible, and on others, you toggled switches to enter programs and issue commands. The Underwood No. 3 was built in the early 1900s and the sturdy little typewriter was built for long hard usage and it is still working today. It weighs around 30 pounds or 13 kilograms which was average for that period. Next we have a comptometer which was an early adding machine. Uh, this one unfortunately doesn't work but it's um, a good indication of how that type of technology uh, was used at the time. Go. This is a Remington typewriter from about the 1940s. It works. It's a very sturdy machine and um, it was good technology at the time. Then we move over to the IBM Selectric, which was introduced in, by IBM in 1961. Instead of having individual keys that went up to strike the, the paper, it had elements called, we called them type balls, that rotated and pivoted to, before striking. This element could be easily changed for different fonts to use on the same document. In 1961, IBM expected to make 20,000 typewriters. But by the end of the first year, they had orders for 80,000, and by 1986, they had sold more than 13 million. The green machine is a stenographer. It's what uh, people used in courtrooms to record courtroom proceedings. And then the next thing here is the touch right, the perfect way to learn touch typing in one day. It had a, a simulated keyboard and a record that came along that taught you how to do touch typing. In April, this is the uh, Apple. 2C. In April of 1984, Apple unveiled Apple 2C with an intensely, with an, with an intense publicity extravaganza at the Mars Capone Center in San Francisco. Priced at $1,300, more than 50,000 units were sold that day. The innovative design won the Industrial Design Excellence Award. Size and weight made it very portable, which was one of the major reasons for its popularity. What we have here are the punch cards on a piece of lightweight cardboard. Successive positions either have a hole punched through them or are left intact. The rectangular bits of paper punched out are also called chads. Thus, each punch location on the card represents a single binary digit. Each column on the card contains several punch positions. A major reason for the corner cut was so that the punch card would not be inserted backwards or upside down. Operators loading cart decks would quickly recognize an inverted card. Now we're moving on to the 8-inch floppy disk, which was really the where the name floppy disk came from. As the time progressed, the 8-inch became the 5 and a quarter inch. This is one that many people are familiar with. And then we progressed into the 3 and a half inch, which everybody probably recognizes. It held 1.44 megabytes of memory. Another funny disc is this huge disc here. This held five megs of data, so equal to about four of these. Moving on to our hard drive display. This one here, huge drive, 1.2 gigabyte, probably from the late 70s. We move into something from the late 90s, 98, 99, 2000, which was a six gigabyte drive, which was considered a large drive at that time. And the next drive we have here is a laptop drive at 80 gigs. You can see how the size has progressed. As space requirements increased, we went through several different reiterations of space, disk that could hold more and more memory. This is a little 16 meg SD card. We then moved into the zip drives, this one was capable of 250 megabytes, which was large at that time. This was an Imation Super Disk. Pretty much the same, it held 120 megs. And as uh, time progressed, we moved into the CD disk player. This one probably held a disk about 650 megs. If we move over to here, this is one of the first modems that were marketed. You simply dialed your service provider, and when this phone started ringing, you put it in the cradle, 
and made your connection. Over here, we have, it's still an external modem, but you actually attached the phone line, therefore you didn't need the, the acoustic coupler. And as time went on, we moved into the internal modem cards, like the ones we see here. This is the one that most people, they're still built into a lot of computers at this time. What we have here is the Palm Pilot, usually referred to as a personal digital assistant. What you did, you had a cradle that you attached to your computer. This was docked to the cradle. And you could upload calendars, a uh, certain amount of email. You couldn't connect to your email, but you could download email to it. It progressed to this model where you could actually do the same functions, but it had an actual text editor, and you could take notes at a meeting, etc. This keyboard folded into thirds, and eventually was about the same size as that. Very lightweight, easy to carry. This is the Digiac 4030 Digital Computer Trainer. Not much known about it. It was done, uh, used for making, uh, testing logic problems. Used the uh, punch cards, etc. And we're happy to have it. Very little information about this unit. Moving over here to the PET. The PET was an acronym for the Personal Electronic Transactor. Quite a name. Announced and demonstrated in January of 1977 at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago. Months before the Apple II, the Commodore PET was the world's first real computer. That meant that the computer was ready to use right out of the box. Just plugged it in. Before that, often it was a kit that you had to put together. The small keyboard was referred to the, as the chiclet keyboard. Uh, well, obviously because of the size. This was changed for a standard keyboard the next year. And the, the, another interesting thing about this was the Commodore Basic Operating System was written by Bill Gates and Paul Allen when they were just starting Microsoft Corporation. Okay. This unit right here is the Commodore VIC-20. It was the first inexpensive color computer available, costing less than $300. It can only display 22 character of text per line, so its use for business applications is minimal. But people loved it for games. It had good color, joystick port, and it was cheap. The VIC-20 is also the first computer ever to sell over a million units, just a few months ahead of the Apple II. And production of the VIC-20 was up to 9,000 units a day, with sales eventually re reaching $305 million. The price of the VIC-20 eventually dropped to less than $100, the first colored computer to do so. Okay. This unit here, the interesting aspect in this computer is the fact that it was built at the U of R on site for our use at the campus here. It's called a Cougar, named after the local athletic teams. This little computer here, called the Tandy Dreamwriter, this rare little computer was built circa 1992 by the NTS, a Canadian firm. The marketing and distribution was done by the Tandy Corporation. It had a full-size keyboard. The display is eight lines of 80 characters each, onboard memory, stores 40 pages of text, plus there was a PCM CIA card on the side for additional storage. And you simply just created your documents and started typing. This little laptop here is a Toshiba, built in 1987. It was running on a early version of DOS. All the basic functions of a text editor, this is an early form of Microsoft Works. Uh, the interesting part about this is that in 1987 they did have LCD screens available for these little units. It costs about $1,200 in those days. This computer here, the Apple, was released in 1996 and was priced at $1,500. As part of the commemorative celebration marking the 10th anniversary of the Apple computer, a special limited edition was introduced at product launch, the WAS. You can see his name right there. The first 50,000 units had a reproduced copy of Steve Wozniak's signature at the front corner of the case. Owners of this computer, after mailing in their registration card, were mailed back a certificate of authenticity signed by Wozniak and 12 of the key Apple engineers, as well as a personal letter from Steve Wozniak. And this little Mac SE over here 
was probably the computer that many people first encountered in public school or in high school. Very popular computer for schools. And as you can see, it's still working today. And it's still an interesting computer. Starting with this model here, the Mac Classic. This one was actually a color computer. You can't tell by now, but it actually was one of the first. We progressed into this unit here, which was a, a true color monitor, sometimes referred to as the pizza box because of the small, thin nature of the computer. The performer right here, it was probably one of the first multimedia computers. Microphone here, you had the slot for the floppy disk and for a CD, which, is, which was unusual in those years. Probably in early 1992, that's 93. Here is an early Apple laptop, 1992. It's kind of interesting because it does have the LCD monitor, but it's got a trackball as well, which was very unusual. And probably costs around $4,000 at that time. This computer here, many people are familiar with, the first original iMac, came out in 1998, 1999. See a lot of them still around. And then we have our small little netbook. So after the progression of all our computers, we're back to using computers with little screens again. <laughs>